Hello, and welcome to Holistic Emails, Email and More, a Q&A with. I'm your host, Skip Fedura, and today we are talking about using your testing and metrics to build a business case to do more testing and get better metrics or better user metrics. Now, as this is your show, we bring the experts, but it's your questions that drive the conversation. We're doing this live. It's unscripted. It's unrehearsed. Today, we're going to have a whole lot of fun. But before we go any further, we should take care of a couple of admin things. First, we're going to thank our sponsors. Our platinum sponsor this year is RPE Origin. RPE Origin's team of email experts has been obsessed with email marketing for nearly 20 years. From strategy to creative execution to data analysis, they help companies increase their email ROI through cross-vertical data-centric approach. And our silver sponsor this year is Email Expert. Email Expert is an online community and organizer of both in-person and online events, hosting renowned conferences like the Deliverability Summit, VML, and the MarTech Festival. Beyond events, Email Expert offers a comprehensive vendor directory, an industry blog, and opportunities for online learning and certifications for its members. Email Expert is committed to equipping you with the latest insights and tools to excel in your email marketing endeavors. Now, this is season five. I'm getting close to the end here of season five, but we've got a lot of great content in our back catalog. We've got all the episodes we've done this year, plus previous seasons. So go to www.holisticemailmarketing.com and click on events in the menu and check it out. Stay with us because we've got an amazing lineup of speakers. With me today, we've got Graham McAdam. He's a CRM marketing manager at CalMac Ferries. We've got Kevin Steva. He's the co-founder of another one of our sponsors, Sino, and Scott Cohen, CEO of Inbox Army. With me is best-selling author and award-winning thought leader, Kath Pei of Holistic Email Marketing. Scott Cohen is also an award-winning thought leader. They won the same award different years. Our last panelist is, is having a bit of a technical issue. Hopefully she will join us as we go along. Email marketing is hard. Marketing is hard. Proving that our marketing is working to the CEO is hard. Proving that our marketing is working and what's working was not a lot of this difficulty is down to what we were taught. We were taught to focus on vanity metrics, list size, open rate, click through rate, et cetera. We were not taught to focus on the metrics that align with business outcomes, like downloads, sales, revenue. In turn, this made our conversations with senior management very difficult because they could not translate opens to revenue. When gloating about our great open rate to senior management, they would just nod and they would smile. All the while they're thinking, I can cut that budget because I don't know what an open rate is. And I don't <laughs> see how it makes me any money. Now, this is not entirely our fault. We weren't taught to speak finance. We weren't taught to speak to finance in terms that they would understand. And we were never given access to the data that really mattered. That's all changing. And we're here to help you change all of that. So I want to kick things off. Graham, let's start with you. First off, welcome back from your vacation. I hope you had a great one. Thank you. Yeah. What's the number one metric that you always keep an eye on and why? Teams, the most unoriginal and obvious metric is the revenue that the emails generate. It can make all your efforts seem worthwhile when you see the, the dollar signs come in. Uh, and, and like you said, it's the one that the, the big bosses love to measure success with revenue metric. I, I record it every two and four weeks. We see most revenue come in in the first two weeks, but we've identified uh, another 30% of so revenue comes in but after four weeks of the, the email campaign. So uh, it's always a good idea to, to keep an eye on that. I've also explored the idea of, of recording the revenue data every week for six weeks and, and creating a, like a response curve, which paint a good picture for the performance I'm consuming. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a good idea nonetheless. In addition to the revenue that you can track from email marketing, I'm exploring <clears throat> if we're getting it from other booking touch points. If your business isn't online only, you can see if sales are generate a lot of females been generating sales from offline channels. So if you can have the, if you have the ability to take your segment where you've sent emails and marry it up with sales elsewhere, that can bolster the gravitas of the email channel and you can sell that channel to the CEOs and, and the bosses. I like the notion that you're looking at revenue 
and a bit of a longer tail. And I thought Kath smile, because I know Kath loves to measure long tail revenue. Kath, we'll start with you as the follow-up. What email metric do you think is most often ignored by your clients? Nowadays, I, if you asked me two years ago, I would have said conversions, whatever the, your definition is. Nowadays, it's different. Nowadays, you've got amazing tools like Kevin's tools, Sino, that can help you to actually bring everything in together. For the marketers limited to only seeing their email marketing dashboard and don't have access to their Google, uh, Google Analytics, or, or whatever um, um, attribution uh, uh, software that they use, you do end up just doing the opens and the clicks. Opens, we can talk about all day long and dis it big time, and it seriously needs to be <laughs> dissed, right? I've done some testing recently, and we found that, because I've always said, listen, if you can't do conversions, measure clicks right? That's your closest proxy. But boy, that can really lead you astray as well. And I think we are all beginning to understand that we have to be doing more significant, more meaningful metrics, such as conversions, whether that is downloads, bums on seats, Carmack Ferries, bookings, or, or sales. You just need to really identify what your key metrics are and make sure that however you can do it, you measure them. So yeah, okay. it's it's a tough one. Okay, Kevin and Scott, I'm going to be coming to you, even though I think Kath just took all the possible answers, but that's okay. Before we do that, I just want to say, I forgot to mention in the opening, folks, if you want to get your questions in, obviously this is your show. We do drive this through your questions. We've already got a great question here from Zara, which I'll get to in a second, which is a follow-up for Graham, but put them in the Q&A tab, which is on that side of your screen, and we'll carry on that way. So Scott, you yeah. say that Kath didn't take all the questions or take all the metrics. What metric do you think is most well, ignored by your clients? Obviously, there's still too much importance put on open rate. I mean, iOS 15 blew it up. Everybody has new benchmarks. Opens are not real. They're directional. Conversions, you need to get to conversions at the customer level because there's direct conversion from the email channel, but then there's also indirect conversion that you can argue is driven by email. The email channel and SMS to a certain extent and maybe push, they're the only ones pushing people. They're the only ones marketing to people who are already on the list, right? Most mm -hmm. of the time, media is not spending money on people already on the list. Hopefully it's more using that list for lookalikes and all that fun stuff, right? Conversions at that level. When you send out an email, look at your direct traffic for the next two days. Look at organic search for the next two days. When you see an email in your inbox, you may not respond to the email, but you may go, oh, let me look that up later. We're all humans. We all act in different ways. Even us, the five of us on this call who are all marketers in terms of how we act. We know why we're doing certain things, but we still act how most of our customers do. I used to be brand sides and, and Graham, you, you might see this, that if everybody took their attribution, it's probably 5X the actual revenue that's coming in. Because everybody's claiming credit for that same sale. Mm -hmm. Now, if they've signed up and maybe they've purchased repeat purchases, I would say is a great conversion metric that you're not going to see other channels trying to take credit for. Repeat purchases. That's retention. That's a huge email channel for that. Look beyond just what you can get out of your ESP. Do you have enough insight into the data to go, we had a thousand people in this email list. We had a hundred conversions through email but 250 of them purchased within two to three days after the email went out. I can reasonably assume a chunk of that's because of me. Yeah. That's a good and when one. you go and layer in on top of that, open reach, click reach, you can then go, okay, we actually hit 80% of our database over this particular period, even though 80% didn't buy and be attributed to email. We can assume they've seen the email. We know that they've seen the email because of that yeah. open reach yeah. attribute or click reach. Well, ideally, there, there is somehow an, uh, a channel impact metric, even direct or indirect. That, that would be great. That's I, I, I had a client do that once and where they did it wrong was they gave it a dollar sign, but it, it was an interesting project to work on because we built this email attribution model 
and they gave it a dollar sign, which I fought against. Everybody in the company knew it wasn't accurate other than directional. Right. So you couldn't say, here was a metric with a dollar sign. That's how much money we drove to the bottom line of the business. That mm -hmm. Everybody knew that wasn't accurate. But if it was better than last week, everybody was happy. And I always wanted them to call it like beans, magic beans. How many magic beans do we generate? But I think that's exactly what you're talking about, Kevin, which is what positive impact do we bring, even if we can't attribute it to a specific dollar or pound or euro of revenue? Yeah, I think there are models that, that can calculate the indirect attribute and the direct and, and how far you are away in the funnel from like first step. So I, I think there are some cool models out there that you could implement and even go with some like green, orange, red bar just to give an idea of like how much did my channel impact revenue this period. There are also different metrics that we provide in our platform that a lot of our customers, I think, overlook. One is the revenue percent. Ideally, you would like to have the average or the value close to the revenue percent. The lower the revenue percent, the less I think you targeted the right audience from a sales perspective. Another thing is I think the campaign frequency or mail pressure. I think that's also one that a lot of companies struggle to get a hold on and also to get an understanding what the impact is. If you, I don't know, send more email in a shorter period of time, like what, what's the ideal mail pressure and what's the relation to a different metric. So yeah, I, I think those are also interesting and they are not sales related. And yeah, I think those are already challenging metrics that a lot of companies yeah, I like are struggling that. with. I like that notion of, of mail pressure. I yeah, also, that's a good one. I also like the average okay. order value. We tend to, using Kevin's Sino system, it's really easy to do RPE and average order value, just throw them all in and start mm -hmm. looking for differences when I look at the, the segmentation. So you can learn a lot in-house, but also just comparing the average order value of your email campaigns to another one of the channels. Mm -hmm. Right, that is very likely to be uh, higher because email is that push channel. Email is that one that can nurture and everything and get that and, and then also do upsells and everything. So it's also a good one to be throwing into business cases as well in order to be able to get more revenue. So don't forget about including that one. Next. So before we get too far down the path, we do this follow-up question for Grant. This one's from Zara. Is there anything in particular you do to ensure that revenue continues? Zara finds that there's stops after four to five days. We don't do that, but th there are things that you can do. You'll, you can edit the content within the email, or you could do, you know, if, in fact, scratch that. It's probably maybe resends you'd maybe want to do. If you're not seeing anything is, is generating the revenue and send it to the same segment, obviously seg seg uh, segmenting those that have already been sent it. So you're not pressing sure. them. So yeah, just maybe run more campaigns yeah, if you're not and seeing it, anything. Have you played around with any kind of move link? Other solutions are available uh, where you're dynamically changing the email either because an offer has ended or it's not. You, haven't, it hasn't gotten the take up you wanted, so you, it's, you've got a better deal going on. Well, that's something we haven't done, but it's definitely a good idea. I would say factor in frequency, right? To Kevin's point of that mail pressure. If the revenue stops after four to five days, but you've mailed twice in those four to five days, they may be clicking on the more recent. They may be converting through the more recent emails. Yeah. Also, funny story people, and this shows how weird people are. When I worked for 1 800 <laughs> that's contacts, a statement. We literally sent, mm -hmm. I called it same damn email syndrome, where we would send the same, basically you fell into certain buckets and your creative was the same every week. It was all about just staying top of mind for when you needed to buy new contact lenses. It's not an exciting business. But what we found was that sometimes people would convert through the email, not the same email they got today. They clicked through the one they got six months ago yep. and converted from that one. So I would say 72 hours is a good demarcation of the vast majority of the engagement comes into play there, you will see trickles from there on out, especially if you're mailing frequently. The places where you really want to focus on, I would say, dynamic content where you're changing things mid-flow are those automations where your automations are not meant to be changed every week. But mm -hmm. if you have a running offer, I worked at a mattress company for a long time. We had a block for the offer of the time that we would 
drop in new creative on because we didn't want to change the automations every single time. You have to factor in frequency. You have to factor in all those things. And don't worry so much if the revenue on that particular campaign stops after two weeks because you've likely sent more things inside of those two weeks that have cannibalized that other campaign mm -hmm. just in terms of engagement. Yeah. Yeah, and Scott, I've just, uh, just, we just got a question here from JL along the same lines. So do attribution windows change by industry? Yes and no. I would say buying a mattress versus buying a toy, your consideration time is longer. I would also say frequency plays into that. Again, when I worked at the mattress company, we set ours to a seven day window. Kath would argue that's too short. I know we've had this discussion before, not an argument, but it's because we mailed three to four times a week. I'm going, I feel like seven days is a good window. The vast majority of the Engagement's going to happen in 72 hours. Your bounce is clear out after 72 hours. You could make an argument for 28 days, but if you do that, then your paid media team's going to go, hey, I want 28 day look back on display ads. And you start laughing really hard about attribution windows at that point. So I think if I could turn that question slightly and ask the rest of the panel, the attribution window maybe doesn't change so much by what you're selling, although it could, but it definitely needs to be appropriate for the channel and how much impact the channel could have. Yes? Yeah, and Let's I also go. think every, every life cycle is also different. Sometimes an email just contributes into the story that you're trying to tell a customer. Same with the travel industry. There is a certain period where people decide to go on holidays and all the time before that, it's like warming up and, and try to keep people engage somehow ideally you just know if people buy something in this high season period what your emails right. contributed six months ago to that we are all hyper focused on the last click model or how much revenue this specific email generated yeah it's you, story. i think you used a, an acronym a minute ago and i should have called you out on it and asked you to explain it and i didn't more fool me uh, the, the acronym you used was RPE. I assume okay. that's, that's revenue per email. Revenue per email, which is the same as rev revenue per send. Okay. Um, yeah, but, definitely. But going back it. to Kevin's point, has anybody ever played around with revenue per engagement? In the UK, the big season to book, especially long haul holidays, is January. That's a huge time in the travel mm -hmm. industry. Everybody starts hitting their list late between Christmas and New Year's to capitalize on that. But an email I sent back in August could have actually given the person the idea that next year I do want to visit. I'm just waiting to January to book it. Has anybody played around with a revenue per engagement metrics, people that engage with more emails, generate mm -hmm. more revenue? I think that comes in with the opens and the clicks and the monitoring and making sure that you're getting those in place. I've not heard of anyone do that. It was just an idea I had when Kevin was talking. It's an unbaked skip idea. And if anybody well, out there is listening who knows me, most of my ideas start out very unbaked. Yes, I can see that it's very applicable to B2B as well, right? They've got mm -hmm. longer buying cycles and everything together. So then if that is your business, you just need to put that in, into place. But as far as... What we were talking about with the long tail, I had a client and their logic was we send a campaign every four days, so therefore we're going to cut one off, stop one, and then we'll start another one, right, because it's very logical. But they were leaving themselves out of new budget because they were under-attributing by enormous amounts. I can't remember off the top of my head now. It was a few years ago. But we're talking about a lot of money. Once they actually did bring that to, they were able to get more budget for it. So it is a pretty important point. And more often than not, it's not necessarily just using your gut. It's using data. Go mm -hmm. and have a look. You can see it. It's so easy to find. When is, when do you, because every, you have that peak and then it starts to drop off. The interesting thing is when it starts to drop off, you're going to see fewer conversions, but you'll see that they've got higher intent. The conversion rate is higher much higher and that's because they've saved that email with one thing in mind 
they're going to action it when it suits them, right? Mm -hmm. Everything else is basically there is a definite period that you need to measure. And yes, you can close it off. You can say everything's fine. This is it. Keep measuring it and report on it later. I know you can't keep the attribution window open forever, and that would be silly. Yeah, maybe longer than seven days, but not forever. There's a happy medium in there somewhere. So Make sure you're getting credit for everything that you helped drive. I, I used to have a client, a customer clicked on an email but bought a different product. They didn't mm -hmm. get credit for it. The, if it wasn't for the email, that customer wouldn't have been on the website. Mm -hmm. They sold something else. That goes to my point earlier. Let's say I'm selling t-shirts in an email, but to your point, Skip, the person buys pants instead. I should get yeah. cre credit for the pants. The secondary metric is how many t-shirts did we sell and how many yeah. t-shirts did we sell to the people that received the email, whether they click through or not. I think Kevin, you brought up life cycle and every life cycle is different. A great way to set it up is map your life cycle and then have conversion metrics at each stage. The paid media team's job is to get purchases right away or signups for email. Those are the two things that they should have high level, right? They could have other metrics, but at a high level for emailers, it's get them on the list, either through a subscription or a purchase. Email's job is to go, once they've signed up, how do I get them to make that first purchase? If they've come in as a first purchase, how do I get them to a second purchase? How do I get them to a third purchase? How do I get them to refer people? How do I get them to do all these things? If you map your metrics to each of those phases, you can build a case for, I'm crushing it from subscription to first purchase. Our, we will benchmark all of these things and go, before we came on board and really focused on this, our first to second purchase rate was X. Now it's Y. Hopefully it's in the right direction for you. Mm -hmm. And you go on from there. But that's where you build the use case of email is not just great for acquisition, but retention and all these other things. And yes, Kath, your point, it drops off because 80 was like 85% of people only purchase one time. But that 15%, if you can turn it into 16%, 17%, 18%, it gets huge down the line. I worked at a company where increasing the recurring orders, like the recurring customers, was their main KPI. And even a 0.1% like up was a huge difference in their, in their total revenue. Mm -hmm. For some companies, it's, it's huge if you can scale up. It is. Well, if, you, if, you, yeah. if you go with the, the, the old but very commonly true maxim of 80% of revenue is coming from 20% of your right. clients. Yeah then that 1% actually a makes a huge difference. So what we do for clients is when they send, the, we, we can split the audiences into never bought before, bought once before, bought multiple times before, before they receive that email. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting way to look at your campaign. Like I've sent an email to a thousand people, but I don't know, 500 of them, they made their first purchase. So it could be a different contribution from an email perspective versus I don't know, those people bought the second purchase because they bought once before. And, and we see in the data that indeed the numbers for the first purchase is much higher than the second purchase. And then it goes up from people that already bought two times before. The KPI was changed into how can we make sure that people, if people buy twice, they also buy three, four, five times. And most people that buy twice will also go three or four times. And it's an interesting way to look to the impact of your revenue and divide it into those segments. It's an interesting way of looking at, at your campaigns, not only for email, by the way, but email is the best channel, I think, to measure really on customer level. Yeah. Just wanted to share that. <laughs> yes, all other channels are rubbish. Uh, this is oh. called email and more. It's not called <laughs> search and more. So let's, we're not going to talk about either channel. We um, all work together. We can't do well if we don't get fresh blood on the list. Yes, we're amazing. Go ahead. What was the last time you used that in a budget meeting? <laughs> <laughs> no, I do want to get back to the benchmarking thing though. But mm. before we do that, Scott, you've touched on it. Kevin, you've touched on it. And it's something I maybe I should have thought of previously, but hadn't really thought of it. We're talking about strategic metrics versus tactical metrics. We can't forget those tactical metrics. The tactical metrics are what we do the testing on mm. ultimately. And then the strategic metrics are the ones we should be reporting up the ones that drive the business forward. Is that a fair way to look at it? Define what you're calling strategic metrics. So I'm going to put Graham on the spot. And now if Graham, I don't know what the 
time between email send and revenue typically is for CalMax variants. But that might be too long to run an effective test. So you might have to bring something upstream from revenue or upstream from bookings to, to run your test. And that's what I'm thinking about as a tactical metric versus the strategic metric is bookings or revenue. And sure, you'd love to run your test on that, but that might not be. I don't want anybody who's listening to think, oh, it takes me six months to generate revenue. I can't really run an email test and then wait six months to get the answer. That's where I was going with that. Graham, what do you think? Hey, yeah, it's definitely an interesting point. I need to take into account the average buying cycles as well of your particular audience and, and see how that factors in. We, we, you've done some testing with CalMac Ferries. We always use the meaningful metric. We use bookings, revenues, revenue per email, average order value. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that we make decisions on. And so is it a pretty short time between email to booking? Because I'm thinking about if you sold insurance cars or long haul holidays, you could have an email in August that you want to do some testing on, but you're not going to be able to use revenue because you're not going to get the revenue until January. All right. You've already heard that most of their revenue comes in. The bulk of the revenue will come in within that two-week period. And gotcha. then they also measure through to the fourth, the fourth week, where you will get additional. So they've calculated what their peak is, and we will leave that test run. When we do a test, we do a 50-50 test so that it is running the whole time, i.e. you send it once, but it remains open so that when we understand, when we know, okay, that two week period, that's when the, the bulk of them all have gone and booked, that's when we read the results. Gotcha. I think it's important to, and, and Graham, you touched on this a bit, buying cycle is important. Seasonality is hugely important as well. Mm -hmm. And so the danger of running, even with a test that's open for four weeks, it's one send. So don't ever, unless you're testing something very, for a very small metric, don't ever make a decision off of one send mm. because yeah. all you're learning is what happened on that Tuesday at 9 a.m. that you sent it. Exactly. So the, the test results have to have enough repetition to prove beyond seasonality, beyond randomness, right? One of the tests that I ran in a previous life was an SMS test. Some of you have heard this story before, but... We were sending twice a week and we, and SMS is remarkably more expensive than email just because the cost, especially the U S is cheap. The UK is 10 times the cost of the U S and the company was doing SMS internationally. So they were, the pressure on me at that point was how can we reduce SMS costs? And I went, okay, here's what we're going to do for six weeks. I'm going to carve out 20% of the list and only send one SMS and keep 80% for the six weeks at business as usual, BAU. And then look at overall conversion rate, right? The actual customer conversion rate, not necessarily the per campaign send numbers. Do we actually convert more people over the course of that time? And what we learned, unfortunately, for the coffers of the company was that sending SMS twice a week was almost 2x more. It was incremental to send that second SMS every week. But we needed to do it for six weeks for a few offers, remove seasonality, all those things. If I ran that for one week, that one week was actually proving that once was fine. But over six weeks, we proved actually, no, we need to have the second send every week to get the numbers that we want down the line. I'll have to find cost savings elsewhere, right? Mm -hmm. So that's my one thing I go, Benchmarking is important. Time of test is also super important, right? So if you're setting up a test, and Kath, I know you'll talk about hypotheses. Mm -hmm. What is the hypothesis here? Oh, we think we can send once a week and convert the same number of customers. We learned that was not true. So mm -hmm. that's that very tactical piece there. But if we wanted to cut costs. We can't cut costs there because it will hurt the business. Ideally, mm -hmm. it should be repeatable as well. So if I run a test, now and i run it again in, in a month's time if i don't get the same result then i haven't got a learning right mm. and the same goes when you're testing your automations 
it, it's really tempting. In fact, it's, I, I, I do this a lot with my clients. You have to do the calculations beforehand. You have to work out how many you need, how many people need to be sent to in order for the results to be statistically significant altogether. Then you might, like, a, a, before that period comes, you might, oh, I can't wait, I can't wait. Oh, that looks really different. And you might test it because A is looking much stronger than B. And you go, this is statistically significant. You go, yay, am I ready to call it? No, it's not quite that time yet. So I'll sit and wait. And then you end up a week later, B is the winner. It will do things like that. This is where you have to put everything together and really hold out for the length, for the right one. Or when the, the automation talks. call out is huge, right? Because if your test can be skewed by one person making a different decision, it's too small. And sometimes your automations yep. need a while to build up the numbers. Mm -hmm to get to where you have statistical significance, right? If you're going, oh, I'm going to make a decision after a week, we mailed the 200 people. Yeah. One person skews that whole result, right? And to your point, that's where A becomes B after you've made the switch. You pulled the trigger too quickly. You're like, oh, wow, this is amazing. And you, then you look at the raw numbers and go, oh, the difference in clicks is two people. Yeah, your volume is yeah. low. Testing is a tricky business. <laughs> Testing is a tricky business. Um, it is. But let's dig right in. Uh, talk a, a little bit about holdout testing or holdout segments. In other words, a segment of people, Scott, you touched on it. You went, wasn't really a holdout because the holdout was getting the BAU segment was what you were already doing. And actually the test was the one that potentially could hurt revenue. Let's talk about how do you get that? How do you get that approved? How do you convince senior management that we're not going to email this cohort of people for the next two, three, four months, because we want to see if not emailing them has any impact on revenue. It would be yeah. really horrible if you didn't email them for four months and they spent more money. That's a yeah. different podcast. When a test goes wrong and puts you out of a job. Do you want to achieve okay. that you want to achieve that the company can drive more revenue <laughs> without sending too much? Yeah. Can go and have we did sorry Graham we did this with Calmac. We looked at those that were sent to right those that had permission and those that didn't have permission. And I can't remember the numbers, but they were phenomenal, weren't they, Graham? I've actually got them in the new book. Um, mm -hmm. Did a case study or a use case of them. The difference was amazing. So you can always look back and have a look who have you got permission for, who don't you have permission for. Compare what the average order value is compare the frequency of purchase, compare the customer lifetime value over the certain period. And then if you're assured of that, you can go and pitch that to the powers that be. The problem is that if you give them those figures and say, listen, guys, we really believe that email, we want more budget and we believe that email really delivers revenue. So we want to do a holdout test. We don't want to send this segment email for a period of time they'll go what are you talking about of course not email delivers revenue so you can't do that test just on that fact alone you should say give us more budget then because you mm. have just admitted that is the case i hate to face you in court <laughs> and you don't have to just completely hold them out altogether you could maybe just reduce the frequency like to one email per month and the rest get four or five and you can benchmark it that way and see that we're getting more revenue from those that are getting sent more emails therefore there's a case uh, to increase the email marketing frequency and the program and the support from the powers that be yeah. okay. reference center they're your segments right i want once a month i want twice a month i want whatever or you might have the one or two crazy people go, please send me more. I've run the numbers. What's the value of, what is the lost revenue of an unsubscribe? Especially if you're in a subscription business or something like that, where there it's built in retention. This is one contact lenses, right? There were people who still converted, even though they had unsubscribed from email because they still needed it. They just didn't want to have the weekly emails. AOV was lower conversion rate, but like Kath was saying, your unsubscribes are probably your best corollary. They're not getting anything, but they still need the business. Those are the pieces you can do, but you can go, I'm not going to spend as much. 
they're not going to convert as much. So give us more budget, please. Yes, more money. The money you spend with us is going to produce much more revenue than the month if you gave that same amount of money to like the money that people spend on emails are rounding error for Google display in big companies. <laughs> it shouldn't be that hard to get budget. That's true. <laughs> I, I don't know if anybody in this session, uh, I, I'm guessing probably not because it's getting quite close to the end and, and they're probably quite busy. I've been here in the States for um, a couple of months doing a family thing and signed up for both presidential campaigns, emails, <laughs> three emails a day from each campaign, two to three emails a day. I think it's a lot. I kind of wonder saying, if I'm getting I, both. I, I'm saying you're lucky that I'm getting five, six, seven a day. Somebody ought to do a, some sort of analysis mm -hmm. on average giving per email for those, because it's gotta be low. It's gotta are be they, Are they long emails or short messages? I'm just curious. They're pretty long, actually. It depends. Yeah. 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 And I've gotten a couple that were quite, quite promotional, like the, the Harris Walt campaign sent out an email that if I gave, it wasn't that much, it was like $25 or $50 by the end of that day, I'd be entered in a raffle to meet them. I was, I, I was like, okay, that's cool. I didn't take them up on the offer, but it's an interesting idea. Anyway, Kevin, going back to this previous question about holdouts, and I think Scott gave a really good suggestion to folks about look at the people who are holding out already and look at what they're doing. Now, the purist to me would say, if they unsubscribe, yes, they may need the service, but they're probably not going to get it from us. They're going to get it from, especially for something like contacts, or is it, that, that, that's an easy switching product. Is there a way from just a data analytics standpoint that I can start to get to the, the answer of some of those questions without having a holdout, without having to go to the senior management? and ask. Although the way Cass phrased it, it sounds to me, if you go and ask, you're going to get more budget. So maybe that's just the best answer. <laughs> we but, didn't, we actually didn't use unsubscribes. We used those that signed up to, to uh, booking, but they refused. They, they didn't want marketing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So they're still buying, but the, so they haven't unsubscribed. So yeah. using okay. that, which is probably like where the opt-in opt versus the non-opt-in. Exactly. Yeah. But there, there is always this, not always, you, you can write a predictive model more so you could, based on historical data, you can create some sort of trend line, what to expect. And what if those people that had a certain historical behavior, what if they stop using your channel and stop doing what they always did? That will cost you engagement. It will cost you money. But we had an interesting use case where the revenue significantly dropped year on year through the email. And there was a big panic within the company. And later when we dig into the data, and that's what I like what Scott said, is you need to zoom out and not only look at your own channel, but look from a customer perspective and the whole orders that the customer is doing. And then they found out that those customers that didn't bought anymore through the email channel, which was a big chunk, they kept buying, but through a different channel, in this case, paid media. And then the first reaction was, oh, maybe we shouldn't do any paid advertisement for those unengaged customers in our email, because then they will they use the email uh, again. And then we dig into their engagement patterns. What are they doing currently with the emails that we sent? Because they still received email, but they decided to buy through the paid channel. And then we noticed that I think around 80% of the people that didn't bought this year, but used to buy like last year through email, they were not engaged with your emails anymore. So if you will stop doing any paid social or paid advertisement, it's not a guarantee that they will buy through your email. So you need to re-engage them again with your email before you're going to exclude them from your paid advertisement. Um, it, it's just an interesting way of looking to your customers as a whole and see what channels they use and not only look into your email metric and think that's the whole story around your customer or your subscriber. They're, they just move around and you need to understand why and when and ideally use the right channel in the right place. Not sure if this is related to your question, but this is where, where my answer went. <laughs> what, what was your original question, Skip? <laughs> no, no, that, that was good. I like that was a good answer. That, that was fine. Uh, I think that I think we've covered that one off. That's a good story too. 
Okay. It's, it's an interesting use case. Yeah, we give a lot of presentations about this use case and with the numbers, and, but it's it's happening quite a lot. People year on year, the numbers are lower. People panic, and then they find out that it's not the whole it's not the whole bunch of revenue, or they don't lose the customers. They just move to a different channel, and it's mm. all attribution, and and people don't know because the CRM manager just looks at their email channel or SMS, and they have no clue what the same customer is doing somewhere else. It's just an interesting interesting thing. If yeah. you change the data, sorry, Kath. There you go. go I was going to say, if you change data, like attribution model, does that kind of circumvent that that issue? Like I know GA4 uses, no, you can use data-driven attribution rather than last click. So therefore, you can get that. That kind of stays what is going to what's the most so impactful channel. So I, I use that quite now, and I have seen an uplift in the revenue in my reporting. Mm. Which is good. What I was going to say is, and this is the same stat I bring out year after year, because year after year, it still is relevant. The DMA in the UK, every year they do this, I think it's every year or every second year, a consumer tracking report. Mm -hmm. And every year they ask the consumer, this is consumers, what are the three actions, top actions that you will take when you receive an email that you write something that resonates with you? And it, the top ones are always, at one year, click wasn't even on the top three, <laughs> believe it or not, right? But most of them, are, they're going to save the email for later. Yeah. Or they're going to click through to it, go straight to the website or do a search for it and click on paid media. That's one of the reasons why email doesn't get uh, attribution or, or all of its attribution is because of how the consumers use email as well. And, and as long as we were aware of that. Yeah, and don't underestimate the search bar in your inbox. People, it's like this mini Google that we all have with all emails that we would like to keep and historically want to find something. Um, so even from an SEO perspective, you can think about search terms that you would like your email to be found in the inbox to make sure that you include them also in your email. Because people just still use a lot to search for a specific email that they received in the past. Because they know, they remember, they want to see if it's still uh, still available or still stuff like that. So it's, it's also something we need to consider. And we have, in, in China, we have two different ways of looking at the data. One is sent date. So you can see the results of all the campaigns that are sent in a certain period. But we also have event date. So where you can see all the actual events happened in a certain period of time, regardless when the email was sent. And we see so much engagement and events happening in a certain time that is related to an email that was sent uh, months ago. So it's a very interesting way of looking at the data. Okay, I have so many I don't know, sessions or clicks to the website through the channel, email channel, but they happen through emails that are far from the past. It's a and, funny, yeah. And with uh, iOS, Apple iOS 18, and their, I can't think of what it's called, Digest. It's the Digest. Mm. It's going to, so basically they're going to put all of your emails from your brand. So Cal Ferries will have all of the emails coming down and they're just going to scroll through and choose the one that they want and click on that. So that's why the long tail is going to become more and more important because it's going to make it much easier for them to be clicking on an old campaign, not necessarily a new one. And also means that those that don't keep images, don't keep those emails active, probably going to have to change a bit too because people are going to be calling upon them more. That's a, that's, that sounds like a topic for a whole additional webinar. I, so now we've got two bonus sessions that we're going to have after this one. We're getting close to time and my, my pretty standard wrap up question is what's one piece of advice you can give folks to walk away with. And that's where I want to go today, but we've talked about so many different things. So I don't want to, I don't want to limit any of you on what that's going to be. So Graham. Literally, the floor, the ocean is yours. I don't know where Cal McFerries go. I assume they go across an ocean <laughs> or a sea or something. I probably should have looked that up. But what is one piece of advice that you want to give to our audience around testing or metrics or building a good business case that they can hopefully go and implement this week? I think it's really beneficial if you understand the, the value of the email address, the email address that is signed up to marketing. And, and like Kath touched upon earlier in the, the webinar, that you can, you, way you can do that is you can measure who's bought from market, like who's opted in and bought and who's not opted in and bought. 
and you can see that percentage. It could be that only 10% of your whole database is signed up to marketing, but they attribute to 30% of overall business. So that gives that case of, right, okay, if we increase that number, then we should see a significant uplift. So understanding the value of that, that, that opt-in is something I would say to look into. Yeah, that's a great one. Cause the other thing is it gives a, it gives your list a, a monetary value. And when somebody asks you to do something that you think is going to damage the list, you can say, this is what the asset's worth now. And my rec- I, if you do this, the asset will be worth less. And are you willing to take yeah. that hit? Uh, Kevin? What's again, the floor is yours. What's the one recommendation you'd give folks? One of the things that we advise customers is to have an understanding of your KPIs and how they are related to each other. So we have this KPI framework, which is get an understanding that one KPI impacts the other one at the end. And however you do it, even if it's Excel or whatever you use to, to keep the numbers, make sure you get as real time as possible, you get those numbers in place and you're able to steer. It all starts with having an understanding of what your KPIs are and, and, and how your campaigns are performing. I, I think that's the basic. Just get your data in place and, and put them in perspective. And ideally, okay. from channel, to see your channel contribution, contribution versus the others. And you're too kind to say this, but ideally using Sino. But we'll get to that in a minute. Scott, what about you? Yeah, I already touched on it a bit of customer level metrics as best as you can, I would say, and that really falls in line with what Kevin's talking about. And, but another level to what Kevin was talking about is every email you send should have a goal in mind. So it may not necessarily be a purchase. It may be, I think about if you are running a business where they have to make an appointment, right? Pre-appointment becomes super important. It looks like a reminder, but the goal there is to get to the show up for the appointment. If they didn't show up, the goal for the emails after that or to get them to schedule a new appointment. Like think about every email that you send, every single one should have an action in mind. Even if it's not directly in the email itself, those KPIs talk to each other, right? The goal when they're at this stage in the life cycle is to get them to here. The emails may not directly do that, but we know, hey, if they have seven days between the email, the booking of the appointment and the appointment, we're not going to just email them once. We're going to email them three times. And then you start looking at that metric and going, hey, if we mail twice, they only show up at this percent. If we mail three times, they show up at this percent. Think about what those goals are in every email you have and those direct goals. If it's obvious, if you're trying to get a purchase, obviously your goal is a purchase. If you're trying to get them to show up for something later, It may be that the individual email itself doesn't have that metric, but it ties into those higher metrics, those higher goals. That's a great point. That's a great point. Now you can either, uh, I'm going to give you the option. Actually, it's it's your show. You can do whatever you want. You can give us a one last tip or you dropped, you did a little subtle drop there, little tease of a new book coming out. You want to talk about that for a second or you you want to give us a tip before we go? Yeah, I want to give you a tip. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the book's not quite um, finished yet, folks. Yeah. And no, it's just calling upon the benchmarking. It's super, super important because you may not want to do a, um, a business case now for more budget, but in the future, you probably will. So start putting your, your eggs in a row, get your ducks in a row, whatever the story is, and start doing that. Now, of course, that means, though, that you also need to have accessible metrics. And this is where, like I said at the very beginning, a lot of email marketers struggle with because if they're a very big team, then they may have different departments who all have them, but they have to wait a couple of weeks for it to come through and everything like that. You want them at your fingertips, all right? So go and speak to Kevin. He did not pay me to do this. I just literally think that the tool is amazing and I never, ever plug a tool or anything like that. This is what marketers need, really need, because it can change, literally revolutionize your life understanding what it is that you do have the benchmarks make sure you've got some way of actually being able to grab those metrics on a daily basis easily and i'm not just talking about opens and clicks i'm talking about everything like we were talking about average order value all, revenue all the um, good stuff all, all the, the good rest. stuff right okay and yes there is i've literally sent it to the publisher this week Ooh. and and yes second edition New case studies, new content, all the rest of it coming out in a few months. 
Well, great, I can't, great. I can't wait to get, get a copy so I can hold it up. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. Uh, please join me in um, thanking our speakers. Let us know what you thought. Drop us a note in the chat. Got, got a couple already. And But this has been a brilliant conversation, really insightful. I've learned a lot. I've come up with some new ideas that I'm going to take and use in my email marketing going forward uh, between now and the end of the week. And of course, we couldn't do this without our sponsors. So our silver sponsor this year is Sino. Kevin and our friends at Sino have built an amazing email analytics platform that will enable you to explore and benchmark email campaigns like never before. Their intuitive platform makes dealing with data feel like a friendly chat rather than a complicated puzzle. Our gold sponsor this year is Bouncer. Now, Bouncer is an email verification and deliverability platform with super powerful tech carrying people behind it. Use Bouncer to increase your email marketing ROI and land smoothly in your recipient's inbox. Most of all, folks, I want to thank you for spending your time with us today. I know you're busy, and, and we really appreciate that you've taken some time out of your busy days to, to join us for the last hour. Join Kath and I on, in November when we will be talking about innovations in email marketing, which ought to be, yes, no, yes, there, there are having innovations in email marketing. Trust me, we're going to talk about it on the night. Uh, until then, thank you again for joining us. Be safe, good choices.